But today, uh, I'd like to just get back into 1 Corinthians. I know we're done. I just want to do a recap. I'm sorry I'm not as good at Bruce as setting up here a big table or a you know, board behind us and playing Jeopardy this side against this side. But uh, I will ask the kids here, uh, how many qualities of love have we talked about in that? How many? Do you remember how many qualities? How many things of love? How many? Wow. Very good, Peter. I ask now a raising of all the adults' hands. Who knew that? That's what I thought. <laughs> Maybe I'll have to make adult notes too. No, thank you, Emil. That was very good. That's it. That's what we talked about. And now, I guess at the end of this too, would you describe the love of God a little differently maybe than you would have a few months back when you think of the word love and God's love, agape love, uh, and how different it is in the word, how it's used in the world. Again, I'll just take uh, verses. I may not even give references to them. I know I got 15 to go through and I'm not going to hold you up very long. I just want to, and, and uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 9 and 10 Reads this, now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that indeed is what you are doing. Uh, yourself, okay, that's what you are doing to all of the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more. And so this morning, I would urge myself and urge you as a church body, I urge you to do this more and more. In other words, there's still room for growth in love and how to love one another. There's room for me to grow. And as we go through these, uh, I think you'll agree that some of them are very convicting. <laughs> and I see in my own life how I need to grow in this area. And these, these 15 qualities that he talks about love are, are not just... Uh, the cafeteria style where you pick and choose each one that you want to say, well, I fit that one, but I, it means just that you need more work in one area than another. And by the grace of God, we, we grow in these areas. So we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more. And they did. You write, read 2 Corinthians and you or find out, or 2 Thessalonians. But the priority of love, let me just read the beginning again. If I speak in the tongue of men and angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and I have all faith so that as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I delivered up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. And I guess from this, you can preach the best sermon ever preached <laughs> or you can be the most religious person always in church. It doesn't matter if you don't have love. You're still a big zero, <laughs> a big nothing. Your life profits you nothing without love. And so the priority of love we see in this passage and now the 15 characteristics briefly and all of them as a reminder are in the present tense. Love is. What is love right now? And in verse, I believe it's verse 4 we begin. Love is patient. Love is patient. So anytime I find myself being impatient, I can just say, Dan, that's not love. <laughs> that's not love. Lord, help me. Help me be more patient. And so we go to him. And so I'll start with that one first. Or some of your versions will say long suffering. Some of your versions will use different. I'm not going to spend time going again through that. But West translation was that love meekly and patiently bears ill treatment from others. Okay. First Thessalonians 5.14. And we urge you brothers, admonish the idle. Encourage the faint hearted. Help the weak. Be patient with them all. So it's my duty, the duty of the elders of this church to, to be patient with you all, <laughs> but to encourage you, to admonish you as well, and to help the weak, but to be patient with all. And we all, again, that's, that's court. We do that one towards another. We need to exercise that patience towards one another. 
And again, this comes by abiding in Christ, right? As we abide in Christ, then the fruits of the Spirit will begin to manifest themselves. And uh, we, again, his reminder to us was that without me, you can do nothing. So we need him. Again, it goes without saying. Love is patient. Love is kind. Again, present tense. It is kind right now. It's kind of the heads and tails of the same coin, right? Uh, patience is restraining yourself when someone else is irritated or wronged you. Kindness is positively showing grace to those who tested your patience, right? Doing something in return, that's kind. Your response Okay, you're patient. That's good. And it's good to be patient. But now how, how to even do something more positive and show grace is to be kind to them. And so that's kind of the, the heads and tails of the same coin. Jesus himself said about this, to, about himself too, but love and to us, believe, uh, uh, love your enemies. Do good. Lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High. And then listen, this is this part, what God says about himself. For he is kind. God is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. God is kind. If you think your kindness is extended, well, I, I, I just can't be kind to this person anymore. Think of God who says uh, that when we love our enemies, again, all impossible things to do without the spirit of the living God in us. We need this. And but, the Most High, He is kind and to the ungrateful and the evil. Yeah, have you ever done that before? I did one time. Somebody that we gave some food to and they never said thank you. In fact, had some other choice words for me. I turned around and muttered under my lips, you're welcome. <laughs> uh, I felt bad after that because I sure wasn't. Uh, I thought of God. He's kind to the ungrateful. He's kind. To those who are evil. And that's what he expects from his children. We'll be sons of the most high. And our reward in heaven. There's going to be rewards. So be kind. Be patient. Be patient. Be kind. And then it also says that he makes the sun to rise on the evil and the good. And sends rain on the just and the unjust. And that, that's always amazed me. That there's, there can be one farmer living next to each other. One an atheist. Doesn't believe in God. Another who faithfully goes to church and loves God with all his heart. And yet God will send in mercy, will send rain to this man, who, this atheist farm. Let the rain fall on his crops. Let it fall on his crops. He is kind. He makes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. Be kind. Hmm. What's the golden rule? Do to others as you would have them do to you. Be kind. Love does not envy, okay? Love isn't jealous. jealous. Jealousy is actually in that list in Galatians of the works of the flesh. So he says, uh, love is not jealous. Some uh, These qualities that we talk about, this is the first one that's negative. Half of them, roughly half are negative, half are positive. But it's not jealous. In other words, it's not a gift of the spirit, okay? <laughs> uh, and uh, there were divisions in the church. And what was driving those divisions was jealousy. I'm of Paul. I'm of Apollos. I'm of this group. And they had their own factions. And there was jealousy going on in there. And we know what jealousy does. Joseph's brothers. Uh, they sold him into slavery because of jealousy. The religious leaders of Jesus' day. They delivered him to be crucified out of jealousy and envy. And so love does not envy. Isn't jealous. Uh, it's not envious of what other, uh, another person has or achieved. Love finds a self of contentment where I am and with what I have and rejoices in what someone else has accomplished or has, right? So I think these are great things. Again, love. This love of God is like that. And that's what, again, throughout it all, I think we've been talking about, haven't we? That if you want to see the perfect picture of all of these things, look at the Lord Jesus. All right, love does not boast. In other words, it doesn't brag. It's kind of verbalizing your pride, really. <laughs> Boasting how good I am and so on. But in the case with the Corinthians too, they had put up with a, a man who had his own stepmother. 
in the church. And they were bragging about it. Paul says to him, he says, your boasting is not good. You're boasting about this isn't good. You're showing, you think you're showing grace. See, the way to show him love is kick him out and hopefully it will come back. Repent. And so he dealt with that and he says, a little leaven leavens a whole lump. You know, you let this go. Pretty soon everything goes in the church. And so he dealt with it. But it says they were bragging about it. Their tolerance and so on. But here, love doesn't boast. That's uh, And the next one is love is not arrogant. That is puffed up with pride. It's a, it's a, an attitude of superiority. I'm better than others. You kind of look down your nose on others and self-focused. Um, if you want to be great, there's a song we used to sing. If you want to be great in God's kingdom, learn to be the servant of all. Right? There's no room for pride in that kind of thing. And a good verse to memorize, we had our, all our children learn this and memorize this verse from Proverbs 27 too, that let another praise you and not your own mouth, a stranger and not your own lips. So pride, arrogant, love is not that way. Love is not arrogant. Again, the next one, in, uh, number six, is love is not rude. It's related to arrogance, as Bob clearly showed me after that. Arrogance is a manifest, manifests itself most often in rudeness. If you're arrogant, you respond to people in a way that's rude. To behave shamefully or disgracefully, insulting other people or ill-mannered. Uh, really not showing much of an interest in other people. Love is not rude. Number seven, love does not insist on its own way. What's that? Love doesn't insist on its own way. It doesn't seek its own way, advantage, benefit, interest, agenda, or will. In Philippians it says, do, not, do nothing from selfish ambition. That's for you and me. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Ouch. Isn't that hurt? Let's be honest. <laughs> that one hurt. Let me read that again in case you didn't get it. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only for your own interests, but also the interests of others. It sounds a little bit like Jesus, huh? Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. Living for him. Remember, we come to Christ, we no longer live for ourselves, but for the one who died for us and rose again. What a privilege. It's not, it's not a bad thing. We've been going through the commandments this morning. Mark had a study on that. I look forward to that. It was a blessing this morning too. But the commandments are for a blessing. God has the best intention for us in mind. And so with all of these things about love. Uh, number eight, love is not provoked. Uh, some of your versions say irritable, but God isn't easily provoked either. And the description God gives of himself at least four times in the Bible is this. And he said it to Moses. Uh, the Lord proclaimed this. The Lord, the Lord, the God, God, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Slow to anger. And I'm so glad he's been slow to anger. <laughs> James for us now, James 1, 19 and 20 says, Know this, my beloved brethren, let every one person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. That's for you and I. And again, kids, how many, how many ears do we have? How many ears do you have? Two. Very good. How many mouths do you have? One. So we should do twice as much listening as, as we do talking, huh? That's good. That's for us adults, too. Right? Be quick to let every person, there's no exception here, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger because the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Right? And aren't we glad that God is slow to anger? So this is love again. When we're quick to lose our temper, quick to do that, that's not love. Love does not keep record of wrongs. 
It's the best translation of that word. Mine says resentful here, but love does not keep record of wrong. It's a, a, a bookkeeping term again. Love doesn't keep score of the wrong suffered. Colossians chapter 3, it says, put on then, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, God must have knew that was going to happen in the, even in the church, huh? If anyone has a complaint against another, if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you must, so you must, so you must forgive. God is, I mean, think of it. God has forgiven us, me, all my sins, all of them. He doesn't hold a record now against me. And he's canceled the record of death that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross, Colossians chapter 2. He canceled my rap sheets clean. And so now he asked me to do the same with others. Not to hold a grudge. Don't keep a record somewhere in the back of your mind. And again, if you're struggling here with this issue, ask God's help. As you begin to put it into practice, God will give you the grace. But don't hold grudges. Love won't hold a grudge. And another, number 10, love does not rejoice at wrongdoing. Love never rejoices at unrighteousness, anything that's not right. God, and the main reason, because God is holy, right? He's separate from sin. There are, certain, there are just are certain things that love will not do, and we've been reading a list of them. It won't rejoice at wrongdoing in my life, in my own life, or in the lives of others. Love finds no pleasure in someone else's failure or falling into sin. Love is not entertained by the wrongdoing of others. Love is never glad to see others go wrong. Never. Use the exo uh, example of your doctor. Your doctor hopefully loves your health. And that's why you go to see him because he wants to see you healthy. And so a good doctor will hate cancer, won't he? Finds no laughing matter. He finds no pleasure in cancer because he cares for your health. And so how can we rejoice over something that put Jesus on the cross? Love doesn't rejoice at wrongdoing. But what does it rejoice in? Love, on the positive side, love rejoices with the truth. What is the truth? The word of God is truth. Sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. We read this morning. Your word is truth. Jesus said too, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the truth. There is truth out there. There is this, the truth of God. Um, <clears throat> it's, uh, I, I think we use the different example, but Kids, can you tell me if, if stealing is wrong? It's wrong. Well, how do you know that? It's one of God's commands. That's right. But what if society now says, "I think we're going to allow we're going to allow stealing to be okay"? Does that change God's command? No. What about other areas? Always stays true. God never changes, does he? Society does. Society's laws, what, what is now, uh, when I was a kid, there are certain things this country would stand against. And now they, they look at those same things that were rejected years ago, the homosexual lifestyle, different things, and now it's paraded. Pride, they call it Pride Month even this month. And stuff. Now, just because society allows these things and stuff, doesn't make it right. It doesn't make it right. We're to love them. I have nothing against them. In fact, there were homosexuals in this book, in this church that told, talks about love. And by the time it gets to the sixth chapter, he, Paul talks about them. He said, "Such were some of you, but now you've been washed, you've been cleansed, 
you're not the same person you used to be. And so it doesn't matter what society allows or disallows. It matters what does God say, right? So love always rejoices with the truth. Love will always rejoice with the truth and side with the truth. There are some verses to help you along with those things. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast that which is good. Isaiah 5 says, Woe to those who call good evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness and put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Proverbs 17 says, He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous are both alike an abomination to the Lord. So love rejoices with the truth. And John, the disciple, said this, I have no greater joy. No greater joy. What does it rejoice? I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. And I can say the same thing too. That brings the greatest joy to a father's heart. Isn't it? And his children walk with God, who is the truth, and walk in truth. And so love rejoices at those things. Love rejoices at what God calls wholesome. It agrees with God on every issue. All right, now we get towards the end. He says, love bears all things. Now we get to the all things. Um, and so I guess with this last one too, uh, young people, older people, are, are you walking with God? Are you walking with God? Are you living for him? We sang a song today, just, but he will hold you fast. Well, my Savior loves me so. How does he love you so? With the cost of his life, God loves you. Isn't that amazing? And so he's, he's basically set up the Christian life with two basic commands, right? You can sum it all up. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And love your neighbors yourself. That's in a nutshell. He says, owe no man anything. Don't, don't owe anybody money. But he says, owe him this. Owe him love. Owe no man anything except to love one another. For this fulfills the law, the commandments. Let me love. Let the Christian life in me. Do. So let me ask you that question. Do you love God here today? Ask, it, ask yourself, do I really love God? Because you can't love your neighbor as yourself until you love God with all your heart. Martin Luther, that bothered him because he came to the conclusion, I don't love God with all my heart. And he began to call out to God. And God did that transforming work in him. Gave him a love for God. And then, of course, he had a love for people. And he began to preach the gospel. Anyway, let me get back to the topic. Sorry, I got distracted here. Love bears all things. That means we talked about the covering, the idea of protecting what was, uh, what's covered up. Uh, the New American Standard will say it keeps every confidence. So love covers. And a verse that shows that in Proverbs 17, whoever covers an offense seeks love. An offense. Somebody offended me. I, I could tell the whole church, so-and-so did this to me. Or I can say, cover it and say, love. As it says here, whoever covers an offense seeks love. But he who repeats the matter separates close friends. I repeat what I was told in confidence or no. <laughs> That's going to separate. 1 Peter 4, 8. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly. Isn't that what we're talking about? Peter's saying it. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Love covers a multitude of sins. And you must have Christ to have a covering for sin. Romans 4 says, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. So now in return, we cover others. And then, love bears or covers all things. This next is love believes all things. Love believes the best about other people. The, the best about your brother or sister around you. Love refuses to believe an evil report. Really. That's gossip often, until at least until it's confirmed. And then if it is something, uh, love covers the worst in people, but love also believes the best of others. And if something is proven to be true, that a fault is found, 
out to be true with two or three witnesses, whatever, then love hopes all things. Love hopes all things. Love hopes that that brother or sister that has offended you, that God is at work in their heart too. He who began a good work in you and in my brother or sister will also bring it to completion. God work in their life. So love covers the worst, believes the best. And when faults of others are proven to be true, that love hopes all things. That's to trust and expect. In other words, love hopes all things as well. It's impossible. Love never writes somebody off and says there's no hope for them. It's impossible. Nothing good will ever come from this person. But if you've been hurt by a brother or sister, love always hopes for future reconciliation. Even with the world. Or with the child you might have. Love hopes for future reconciliation. Love believes that God is at work in the offender's life as well. I am sure of this, Philippians, it says, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. And then love endures all things. This love of God endures all things. It means to endure the tough times. It's used as an army. Again, we talked about this recently. As an army holding its position in combat. The idea is that we keep on loving others as we're under the difficulty or strain of that relationship. To bear up under hurtful words. To bear up under, and you can fill in the blank, whatever you might be going through. 1 Peter 2.20 For what credit is that to you when you sin and are beaten for it? You endure. But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is gracious in the sight of God. Romans 12 Repay no one evil for evil. But give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as depends on you, live at peace with all men. As far as possible. So far as it depends on Dan Breckner, put your own name there. So far as it depends on you, live at peace with all men. Love endures all things. And I think this is, and this is one I forgot to mention the last time, but I circled it this time. This scripture is meant to encourage us when we are discouraged. And it's Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 3. Consider him, that is Jesus, okay? Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself. Why should we consider him? Lest you, or so that you may not grow weary or faint hearted. When you start to get weary or faint-hearted of enduring all things or all these things we've been talking about today or that person, you get to the point where you don't think you can do it anymore. He says, consider Jesus. Consider Jesus, who endured such hostility of sinners against himself. Unless you be there. So that's, that, that verse there is meant to encourage us. When you're getting down, think of what he went through, and that will give you strength. If he can do it greater. Why is it, what's the scripture say? Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. The greater is he that is in you than any challenge you'll ever face. Or any difficult person <laughs> that would be out there for you to love. Huh? God's greater. And I'll close with a couple, with the last verse here, John 13, 34. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also ought to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. I'd say, I don't know if you've benefited by this study, but I have. In reviewing it even this week, I, I've been blessed by it. Tradition says that John, John, the disciple John, when he was so old, uh, he's the only really disciple to survive and without being killed, really, they think. Because um, Jesus said, you know, what is it, you know, if I, if he's, anyway, uh, John didn't, he, he 
didn't die a martyr's death as what compared to a lot of the other apostles. So when he was old, they say they'd have to carry him so feeble that they'd have to carry him to church and carry him to. Uh, and and if you were a visitor there, and you know you know this is maybe one of the last guys that to walk and talk with Jesus, you know. And I'm sure they got people visiting that church just out of curiosity. I want to meet the disciple John, somebody, the last person to see Jesus alive, to, who walked with him, who was known as the disciple who Jesus loved. And I, I can imagine them, people come and say, oh, I want to hear that man preach. And so John was brought to the church, carried by men. And they bring him and set him down to say a few words because that's all he could say at that time. He just said, my dear children, love one another. That's all he said. So if you're a visitor wondering what the great apostle of the faith who actually walked with Jesus, he just had that one line. You read through the Gospel of John. You read through 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. You find a lot about the love of God in there, don't you? And he, even till his dying breath, was dear, my dear children, love one another. And so this is possible. And, and I can say that I've seen it, the love of God displayed in many of your lives. It bent towards Shelley and I and our family. We are so grateful. You have displayed that and you've walked it and lived it out. Many of you. And I want to thank you for that. And I say this concerning my own life. There's still room for growth, isn't there? And I still get it wrong sometimes. And God has to correct me. But we're not alone in this, eh? are we? Love one another. What's that look like? Look to the life of Jesus. And go through these things. This is not an exhaustive list. The Bible has more to say about love, but we just looked at it to one church. I hope we've benefited some from it here. If you cry out to God and say, God, give me this love, I don't have it. Maybe you're without Christ. It's impossible then. I invite you to come to Christ. A verse we looked at today. Where Jesus looked at the disciple and the people around him and said, listen, come to me. Come to me. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me, for I'm meek and lowly of heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. So if you're never giving your heart to Christ today, he's inviting, he says, come to me. Come to me, I'm going to, you'll find rest. Maybe your soul's been at disrest and unrest for a long time and turmoil. I don't know what's going on in your life. But God does. He sees the turmoil. He says, listen, the only way you're going to get rest is you come to me. I want you to get in the yoke with me. We'll do life together. And I'll tell you, I guarantee it'll be a life of love. Maybe you didn't have a father who treated you well. So Father Day to you maybe isn't a joy at all. But I guarantee that the Heavenly Father it's different. Hmm. He loves you like nobody else could. Earthly father could love you. The Bible says God so loved the world. How did he so love it? In this manner that he sent his only begotten son into this world. But whoever believes in him should not perish. Won't go to hell. Whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's a life that I join in the yoke with him now. We walk through life arm in arm as we sang today and Matt talked about. What a friend I have in Jesus through this life. But all through the next life as well. What do we have to look forward to? This is the love of God here. And we need it in our own lives. And it's available to anyone. It's available to the youngest child here. Or to the oldest adult. Or anywhere in between. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're grateful for the study on your word, of your word. We're grateful for the love of God that has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Lord, I say there's still room for growth. And you urge us today to do this more and more. Lord, let the love of God become something that absorbs our life. Lord, you have been so loving and gracious to us. And we ask in return that we be reminded of that often when we meet 
with challenges. That your love can fill us and we can respond in a way to, we, to the point where we can actually love our enemies. We admit, Lord, we can't do it in our own strength. This will never happen. And so we need you. We need your power. And Lord, I've been memorizing that verse. That great is our Lord. Abundant in power. Abundant in power. Lord, so I pray that that power would be manifested through the lives of your people here. So that others might see that we are followers of Christ because we love one another. So God, take us through this week. Help us. All the challenges. We thank you for the building projects and the things that got done this week. To see your hand at work. We're great. What a privileged people we are. You do love us, Lord. You even care about little things as buildings like this. Uh, We're grateful, Lord. To see your hand involved in everyday life. And I pray we'd see it more and more. We ask your blessing on each one today. And thank you for this Father's Day. We thank you for our Heavenly Father. Who has set before us the greatest example through the life of Jesus. That we can observe. And I pray we would imitate that love. That person. Make us more like Christ. We pray this in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you all. Continue to. Love one another as we go through life. Amen.